Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, it's great to see you guys. It's been a little bit of a hiatus since, if I'm not mistaken, December 20th, maybe even. Wow, too long, way too long. I miss you guys. Uh, I also want to uh, just thank you for coming out here. It's finally a beautiful day outside after so many freezing cold days. I thought maybe some of you would just be sitting out in the sun and enjoying the beautiful, balmy, 50 degree weather. It kind of feels like we're in Florida. You know? <laughs> so uh, I want to thank you all for coming out here. I really appreciate it. I also want to thank the incredible staff of Partners in Torah, uh, Partners Detroit, Yeshua Beth Yehuda, Prime 10, for doing this amazing work to put out this beautiful lunch and learn. All I got to do is show up. They print out these source sheets, they get the food, they do everything and really make, do a good job of making it beautiful for us. So let's give them a big round of applause. And let's also give a big round of applause to the amazing people at Torah Anytime, which is a website and an app, Torah Anytime, that has thousands and thousands of lectures on every Jewish topic imaginable. And uh, God willing, this will be up there if you want to pass it on to your friends later. They do incredible work. Let's give them a big round of applause to Torah Anytime. Okay, now I'm really excited. We got a lot, a lot to talk about today. So you remember where we left off, okay? Where we left off, we were talking about eight of my favorite verses in the whole Torah. The verses that told the story of Abraham's incredible kindness that he performed on behalf of these three strange men that were dressed like Arab merchants who are traveling through the de desert. And Abraham runs and begs them to come in. Remember, he's in the middle of recuperating from surgery. All is good. They have a great meal. Uh, I didn't know, I didn't, we didn't actually cover this inside, but after the meal is over, they tell Abraham, you are going to have a son in a year, which is amazing news to Abraham his entire life. He's been hoping and begging and pining away that he should have one son at least with his wife, uh, with his wife Sarah. And these angels tell him, you're going to have a child in a year. So that's one great piece of news. And then they go. And then God tells Abraham, I can't hold back from you. I got to tell you what's going on. The other two guys who just ate at your door, they're on their way now to go destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Right? The five cities, as a matter of fact, of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we all know the story where Abraham desperately prays to God on behalf of the evil people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And in the end, he's unsuccessful at dissuading God from wiping out these cities, but there was two angels who ate at his house. So the first angel came to give the good news, Abraham, Sarah, you're going to have a child in a year. Two more angels. One went to go destroy the city, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then the other angel was sent to go save Lot. Who was Lot? Lot is Abraham's nephew. How did he, what was his sort of life story? If you want to read a short synopsis of Lot's life, so until this point, here is Lot's life. Lot's dad, Nahor, was sort of on the fence. Should I follow Abraham's God? Should I not? Abraham at one point gets saved. He's thrown into a fire by Nimrod. Uh, and, and he's saved because he has absolute unshakable faith in God. Nahor gets thrown in the fire as well. He didn't have absolute unshakable faith in God. And unfortunately, he was burned. So... Abraham, Abraham has compassion on his nephew, Lot, takes Lot in, raises Lot as a child from the time Lot is a little child. And then Lot, if you remember before we talked about it, Lot and Abraham had some disagreements about how their sheep should pasture. Should they pasture in other people's lands? Should they not? We talked about an opinion that was everyone agreed they shouldn't pasture in other people's lands, but should they give the appearance even of pasturing in other people's lands? And so on and so forth. But Lot and Abraham separated, if you remember earlier on, and Lot goes to live in Sodom and Amorah, Sodom and Gomorrah, because it's incredibly rich land. He goes there because it is a dream of physicality. It's incredibly fertile, incredibly wealthy, and he sees the beautiful, the glitzy, the glamorous, the shiny, and he says, I want that. He heads off to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham stays where he is. Now, of course, the people of Sodom, from now on we'll just call them Sodom and Amorah, so the people of Sodom, they were horrible people, they were very, very wicked people. They had a policy. Their belief was what we call today social Darwinism, which is the idea is that Darwinism is the concept of survival of the fittest. Social Darwinism is that society will weed out those not strongest and not able to be able to carry on. And this way, by letting society sort of take its course and its path, we'll have a stronger society. So anybody in Sodom who was poor... No one was allowed to help them. 
Because that was their goal. Remember, we want to get a strong society. So if we help out the poor and we help out the unfortunate, then what's going to happen? All the poor and all the unfortunate are going to start coming here and they're going to steal all of our wealth. So instead what we need to do is nobody's allowed to be nice. Nobody's allowed to be kind. No one can share their sandwich with anybody else. And if you do, it's on pain of death. Because we are so intent on preserving this society which will prevent our society being flooded with the poor, unwashed masses, right, which is ironic. If you look at the bottom of the Statue of Liberty, give me your poor, your, your huddled, your unwashed masses, right? What we said, what America said to the whole world, we'll take them all in and uh, give them opportunity. So Sodom and Gomorrah said, Sodom said, we don't want those people. And if you help anybody out, you're endangering all of us. Because, you, you know, you feed one cat, the next morning there'll be two cats there. So you feed one homeless person, the next morning there'll be two homeless people there. And therefore, Sodom had the policy, no handouts, no free lunches, on pain of death. Now, it was a very wicked place, and God said, I can't have that ethos starting to contaminate my world. It will start in this very, very wealthy enclave, incredibly elite people who are very wealthy, very successful. Other people are going to see that, and they're going to say, we want to be like that too. How do we get like that? Oh, their ethos is we don't, we never be kind to anybody. And we're the fittest, and we're the ones who survive. And if you can't make it, well, you don't really, you don't really belong in our society. So God decides that he has to destroy Sodom, and he sends one of those angels to go do that. However, Lot is going to get saved. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. There's a lot to talk about. I'm very excited. Let me first make a bracha on this incredible water, which I'm also very excited to drink. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Malach HaOlam. Let's look at your sources. Source number one. Beratius. Perak Yutas Pasuk Chavtes. Genesis 19.29. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain by Yehi B'Shachis Elohim Es Arei HaKikar by Yizkar Elohim Es Abraham and God remembered Abraham and he sent Lot out from the midst of the destruction when he overturned the cities in which Lot dwelt. So God is going to save Lot, but it says here, God remembered Abraham and he saved Lot. So did he remember Lot and he saved Lot? He remembered Abraham and he saved Lot? What exactly is the great merit that Lot deserves to be saved, right? He chose to live with the wicked. He chose to live in a city where the ethos or a community, uh, it was actually five city-states, he, he chose to live in a region where the ethos was, we never do any acts of kindness. So what exactly did Lot do to deserve to be saved? Tells us Rashi, quoting the Midrash. So, source number two, what exactly did, Avram, did Hashem remember about Avram that he saved Lot? He remembered the following. Avram was going down to Egypt, and he knew that the people of Egypt were very, very wicked. And if they knew that Sarah was his wife, they would have killed him so they could take his wife and bring her to the king because she was exceedingly beautiful. She was described in the Talmud as one of the five, four most beautiful people to have ever lived, the most beautiful women to have ever lived in history. So she was exceedingly, exceedingly beautiful. The Egyptians most certainly would have murdered Abraham because we're not going to commit adultery. No, 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 we don't do that. We'll just kill the husband. Then it's not adultery anymore, right? The homicide is not a problem. Adultery, a little bit frowned upon, you know. So... Uh, you know, it's fascinating, by the way, just, there's a fascinating thing in society today. You know, we're talking about this time where people are ripping down all these statues of, you know, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and defacing memorials and all that. And what's fascinating is, is that it's what, what ills society is prepared to forgive and forget and what ills they're not. Interestingly enough, I'm sorry for all you women, but people who treat their wives horribly get a pass. Horribly. You treat your wife horribly. So, for example, Martin Luther, for example, Martin Luther King. Bad dude to his wife. Perennial, perennial uh, a cheater and often uh, physically violent to his wife. And yet he gets a pass. He's king, right? Well, he actually is king, Martin Luther King, right? <laughs> he gets a pass. Mahatma Gandhi, by the way. See, this is crazy. People don't know about Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Mahatma Gandhi, the father of modern India, the father of civil non-cooperation, civil disobedience, right? What a hero, right? What a hero. Yes, he did some very heroic things, but again, he was horrible to his wife. And I can't get into details, but if you do some research on him, you'll find out that he did some things that were horribly unethical, and you probably would not want your children around him, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so Mahatma Gandhi, not such a great guy, but he gets a pass. Certain things society says, it's okay. You know, like it's like, kind of like the Egyptians, you know. 
Adultery, we wouldn't do that. Homicide's much better. Kill Abraham, take the wife, right? Okay, so Avram says to Sarah, do me a favor, just tell them that you're my sister, right? This way they're not going to kill me because they're not going to kill a brother. They'll just take the wife, which is what they did. And then God basically let uh, the king of Mitzrayim know very quickly this is not going to happen. And he returns him with a horrified, I can't believe this, I didn't know, whatever, here you go. Okay, now who was in that little caravan? Who's going down to Egypt with Avram and Sarah? Lot, right? Lot was the person of their household at that time, right? Remember, Avram had taken in his nephew and had raised him. Now, as they're going down, Lot hears the conversation between Avram and Sarah, and it goes like this. Av Sarah, Avram says to Sarah, listen, they're going to kill me if they know that you're my wife because you are a prize, and therefore I'm begging you to do a chesed with me and tell them that you're my sister. Now, immediately, in Lot's head, he starts thinking, hmm. If I divulge this information and tell the border guards, by the way, he's saying that they're, they're, they're saying sister and brother. Not the case. I've been living with them for the last 15, 20 years, and it's actually their husband and wife. What would they do? They'd say, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Lot. We really appreciate it. Take out their gun, shoot Abraham, bring Sarah to the palace to, uh, to Pharaoh, and then reward Lot, give him a $100,000 check, you know, whatever it is, right? Maybe they pay him Bitcoin, I don't know, whatever it is, right? It's like, you know, so, you know, they would have given Lot a big prize, cash money. But yet Lot didn't say anything. Lot kept his mouth shut. And in that merit, God says, I remember Abraham. And that one of the reasons why Abraham is alive is because Lot didn't open his big mouth. And he foregoed, he he let go of the big cash money prize that he could have gotten. i got to save Lot now. That's what Rashi brings. Rashi, let's see the source inside again. Rashi says, what does the remembrance of Avram have to do with Lot? He remembered that Lot knew that Sarah was Avram's wife and that he had heard in Egypt that Avram said to Sarah, she is my sister, yet he did not reveal the matter because Lot had pity on Avram. Therefore, the Holy One, blessed be he, the good Lord above, had pity on Lot. Now let me ask you a question. If Lot would have squealed on Uncle Avram and told the guards in Egypt, by the way, they're lying to you, they're really married, and then they would have killed Avram and stolen Sarah, where would we rank Lot in, in terms of like scoundrels of all time, right? So you'd have like Hitler at the bottom, you know, Torquemada, right? <laughs> like you'd have like uh, Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, and then like just above those guys would be Lot, and just above Lot would be the UN. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Lot would have come in, like, among the top, the, the top ten biggest scoundrels of all time. Your uncle has pity on you, takes you into his house, gives you everything, treats you like a son, raises you up, and you feel like, wait a second, yeah, of course he's my uncle and he took care of me from the time I'm a child and did everything for me, but there's a cash money prize on the line over here, so I don't mind if Avram gets killed, I'm going to go squeal. What a scoundrel he would have been in. Does, does that mean you've you got to reward Lot for not doing that? You're going to reward Lot? That, that's why you save Lot's life? Because he didn't rat out the uncle that saved his life and raised him up from his childhood until, until he was a wealthy man of his own right? I, that doesn't seem very reward-worthy. But, even more, to complicate this question, let me show you something that's even more reward-worthy. Lot sacrifices his life to do kindness. Let's see the next verse, or the next source. Source number three. Voracious, <coughs> Yud Tess, Aleph, through Gimel, Genesis 19, 1 through 3. And behold... And the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. And Lot saw and arose towards them. And he prostrated himself on his face to the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, please turn to your servant's house and stay overnight and wash your feet, and you shall arise early and get on your way. And they said, No, 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 no. We'll stay in the street. We know the stories here, right? There's no free lunches over here. And if, you, if you're caught, Lot, doing kindness to us, you're liable to get killed. It's all right, man. Well, we, brought our, we brought our sleeping bags. We're okay. Secret, of course, angels don't need sleeping bags, right? Okay, but whatever. That was just added for excitement. Okay. But no, but what does Lot say? Lot's not taking no for an answer. He urged them strongly. 
No, 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 please, don't worry about it. I really want you to come to my house. And they turned into him, and they came to his house, and he made them a feast, and baked unleavened cakes, and they ate. Now, if you read the language here, it sounds kind of reminiscent to someone we just read about last week, or last time we met, which was a few weeks ago. It sounds exactly like Abraham. He sees strangers, he runs out, bows down before them, my lords, please come to my house. Right? They say, no, 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 it's okay, and he's begging them. No, he urges them, and they come in. If anything, Lo is even more impressive, because Abraham, yes, he's in pain, granted, but no one's going to kill him for taking in strangers. Lot is living in a city where you take in strangers, you are liable to get killed. You know what the Talmud says? The Talmud says the final straw on the camel's back that doomed Sodom was there was a young maiden who saw a poor person in the street and she gave him some food. And the people of Sodom were so enraged. How dare you give a food handout? Before you know it, this place is going to be swarming with homeless people. They took her. They covered her in honey, and they threw her up on a roof where there was uh, onto like a, a, a beehive, and all the bees came out, and they stung her to death. And this girl is screaming in pain. This young maiden is screaming, being slowly killed to death, right? Death by a thousand bee stings. And no one's doing anything. They're watching. This is what happens when you do kindness in our city. We're not about that game. That's not how we roll. So that was when God said, that's it. Sodom, you guys got to go. You're done. Your whole ethos needs to be eradicated from the world. So there's a real danger over here for Lot. And he's willing to take them in. So Avram is willing to do kindness through pain. Lot is willing to do kindness on threat of death. It seems like Lot has done something far greater than Avram. And he does the same thing. He makes them a feast. He makes them matzah, which is what Avram served them as well, the cakes and everything. The matzah cakes. So why are, why are we saving Lot? Because he didn't rat out his uncle, which if he had done that, he would be, again, number seven on the world's greatest scoundrel list. Why are we not saving Lot? Because he was willing to risk his life to, to do kindness. Is that not worthy of saving him for? Okay, that is our question. The answer is, after the last week, or week and a half, or class and a half, of discussing all the great things about kindness, and how awesome kindness is, I've got some information for you that I must share with you. Kindness can also be a horrific thing. Kindness can be a real, real bad thing when it's used properly, sorry, improperly. There's nothing in this world that's good or bad. Everything in this world depends on how you use it. Kindness can be a terrible thing. Let's read a little further. But before we even read a little further, hold on a second. Lot is risking his life to give people lodging, which they don't even need. Right? They can sleep in the street. They're okay. Lot is risking his life. Let's say Lot is killed. Now his family has no breadwinner. Was that the right move? Right? Was that the right move? Just let's, 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 we're, we're, we're going to ease into this. We're going to ease into this. For starters, you want to risk your life for kindness? Is that a kindness to your family? You decided that you want to do an act of kindness. I want to do a mitzvah. It's so important for me to do this mitzvah right now. There's a tornado right outside your house. And you say, literally, we're talking about not like it's coming and you see it and people are taking videos. I'm talking about, like, there's a tornado right outside your house. And you're like, you know what? I really want to bring brownies to Mrs. Cohn next door. I know she hasn't been feeling well. I'm going to bring the brownies. And your wife's like, don't go out. It's, it's crazy out there. There's a tornado. You're like, yeah, I know, but it's mitzvah time. And I don't, do, I don't stop mitzvah time for nothing. I'm on the mitzvah train and the mitzvah train don't stop. And you're like getting ready to go there. You're like, please, don't go outside. There's a tornado out there. There's proje- there are cars flying through the air like projectiles. Kindness time. Sorry. I'm at the post office. Nothing stops me. Not the rain, not the sleet, not the cold of winter. I ride through the night. Paul Revere. Oh, you name all the heroes that you're thinking of. The Pony Express, whatever it is. I am there, and I'm going to do my kindness. That's not a kindness. That's A, absurdity. 
and be cruelty. Because what happens if you walk outside to bring the brownies over to Mrs. Cohn, who's next door, and she may need those brownies, granted, but you go outside and a, a passing pickup truck slams through your head, your kids now are orphans, your wife is a widow because you want to do kindness. Is that really kindness? <coughs> Let's go a step further. So Lot does this whole shenanigan. He gets these people to come to his house. And his wife kind of is involved in letting people know that my crazy husband brought home kind of strangers. And before you know it, there's a large group of people outside the house. And they want to kill the, the, the strangers, for starters, and then they'll, then they'll deal with Lot. Source number five. And they called out to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us and let us be intimate with them. By the way, that's where the word sodomy comes from, for real. And Lot came out to them to the entrance, and he shut the door behind him. And he said, My brethren, brothers, friends, countrymen, fellow Romans, please do not do evil. Behold now, I have two daughters who have not, have not been married, two uh, maiden daughters. I will bring them out to you, and you do with them as you see fit. But to my men, don't do anything, because they came under the, because they have come under the shadow of my house. I've got a mitzvah here. I'm not ready to give up my mitzvah so fast. So instead, why don't you take my two maiden daughters, do whatever you've got to do to them, I don't care, as long as you let me have my mitzvah. Is this kindness? This is absurdity. This is insane cruelty. Right? Like, literally, like, insane cruelty. Take my daughters, do whatever you want to them, just don't take away my mitzvah. I'm being kind right now. The kindness train does not stop. Express line from here to heaven. I'm doing a kindness, I'm doing a kindness, and I will not let go of that kindness, no matter what. Is that kindness? That's absurd cruelty. The idea is like this. Lot grew up in the house of Abraham. He grew up in a house in which people did kindness all day and all night. And he found out something. He found out that doing kindness makes you feel good. Good. But then he got addicted to kindness. Like a drug. And there are people out there who are addicted to kindness. Like a drug. There's a famous story about a great rabbi who calls one of his students over after davening in the morning. And he says, listen, I've got a very sensitive issue to talk about. I know that you're, you're a big Baal Chesed. You do kindness a lot in the community. And uh, there's a, a very dire situation in the community, and I'm wondering if you can help. And the guy says, Rabbi, of course, of course. It's whatever you want. I mean, you say it. Hineni. I'm there. Hineni. And the rabbi says, there's this woman in our community. She's like, she's like a, a widow. And in the morning, she has to get her kids out to school. She's got a lot of children. It's absolutely overwhelming. She's got no help. And, and she just she can't take it anymore. And I'm wondering if you can go help out this woman. It's a, it's a huge mitzvah, big chesed. The guy says, of course, of course. Be there tomorrow morning. What's the address? And the rabbi gives the man his own address. <laughs> your wife needs your help. Your wife is trying to get the eight kids out to school in the morning, but you're so busy doing chesed all over town. You're so ready here in a second. Oh yeah, I'll be there, no problem, tomorrow morning. What do you mean? It's your wife who needs your kindness. She needs your help in the morning and the kids out to bed, get out of bed. She needs your help at night, putting the kids to bed, but you're busy, you're volunteering on this board and that board, and you're doing this chesed and that chesed. Who said it's a chesed? You're addicted to feeling good about yourself. That's what you are. It's not a kindness. It's a cruelty. You're abandoning your wife and your children because you are addicted to kindness. Kindness done right makes the world go round. Kindness done wrong turns the world back on itself. As the source you'll see in source 6 says the Sfas Emes, the great Gera Rebbe, in his Shir on Parshas Lech Lecha, the year 5649. Many of the Hasidic masters, they would give their, 
main discourses over on Shabbos, and there were always people in the audience who had like this incredible encyclopedic memory, and they could literally record, they would remember literally like word for word what the Rebbe would say over Shabbos, and then immediately after Shabbos they would write it down, and when their books were printed, you could often see like the, sh the, the year, the Shabbos that the rabbi gave this speech. So this is the Ger Rebbe's speech in the year 5649, and he says, says this Fas Emes, like we found, call, listen carefully, kol hamerachem al ha'achzarim, Whoever has pity on cruel people, sofo leos achzar, you will end up being cruel yourself. Again, this is such an important concept because we're going to see now this applies all over our world today. Kol hamerachim al ha'achzarim, anyone who has pity on cruel people, sofo leos achzar, will be a cruel person himself. Let me give you a couple examples of people who have pity on cruel people. There are people who protest, make massive demonstrations for the release of Palestinian murderers. There was someone named Ahmad Sadat, who was a murderer, not Anwar Sadat who was murdered for trying to make a peace deal. But Ahmad Sadat, a murderous terrorist, and you have all these people, who, they're, they're, they would tell you, they're fighting for social justice, they're fighting for freedom, they're fighting for, for the Palestinian cause, these poor people. And you're protesting to get a murderer let out of jail. So that he can do what? Murder more people? You're a murderer! If you are being pitiful, you're having pity on a murderer and saying, let's be nice, let's let him out, you are a murderer because you let him out, you and your efforts let him, you protest and eventually the, the PR and you get all the media and everything and eventually Israel says, okay, we'll let him out and he goes out and he kills another person. You have a hand in that murder. You are cruel. PETA, people for the ethical treatment of animals, are not necessarily for the ethical treatment of humans. Let me read to you a quote from Gary Yurovsky, the former president of the animal rights group ADAPT, and now a national lecturer for PETA. He said, do not be afraid to condone arson at places of animal torture, which means you can burn down a slaughterhouse. And they said to him, what if people would die in that process? And he said, if the animal abuser would die, this could be a lab where they're testing medicines on mice so they can save human lives, right? He said, for example, that if the animal rights abuser would be killed in a lab firebombing, he said, I would unequivocally support that too. That's, you, you, you call yourself a kind person? <laughs> Look at the world we're living in. It's overturned on its head. You have such pity on these poor little animals that are there saving human lives. Now granted, hopefully in the near future we will get to a place where they're, and they're working on this ready right now. Hopefully we'll get to a place in the future where we'll be able to test medicines without using animals. And everybody wants that. But you have such pity on the lab rats that are saving human lives and you're willing to condone the death of human beings in the process. Not condone, unequivocally support. That's not kindness. That's absolute cruelty. And I'll tell you one that hits closer to home because the people guilty of it were, were all, many, many of the Jewish people. The release, no, it's not, not the release. The prisoner swap for Gilad Shalit. Now Gilad Shalit was a US Army, uh, sorry, an IDF soldier who was captured by murderers and kidnapped and held in the Gaza Strip. And Hamas demanded over a thousand prisoners to be released from Israeli jails 
many of them involved in terrorist attacks, for the return of Gilad Shalit. And people all over Israel were protesting that the government should do it. And eventually it did do it, under the pressure. Of the thousand people that have been released in the Gilad Shalit prisoner swap, many of them have already been involved in further acts of terror. Now the Gemara has a very clear ruling on this. The Talmud says, you are not allowed to redeem a captive for more than his worth. Because it just encourages more kidnappings. So the ethical imperative here was not to. Now, I have my opinion of what they should have done. Right? Meaning, there's plenty of things they could have done. Right? Just absolutely shut down Gaza Strip with their superior army and said, until you release Gilad Shalit, there's going to be some serious suffering here. And yes, people would suffer. But that's how you get back your person. When someone's holding your person captive, you, you do what you got to do. You don't kowtow to the terrorists. You don't kowtow to the terrorists. You go after the terrorists. You just start taking out... Look, Israel's got a lot of infiltrators all over Gaza. You just start taking out terrorists right and left. Right and left. Just bam, bam, on the streets. Some, summary executions of terrorists. Until they released Gilad Shalit. But the one thing you don't do is release a thousand terrorists back onto the streets where they've killed more people. What are you going to say now to the parents? Yes, Gila Chalit's parents were outside the prime minister's home and office all the time, as they should be. If my kids, God forbid, were ever captured, I would be the same way. And Israel should have responded with superior force and gotten back Gila Chalit. Kidnapped. The, the family members of all the Hamas head, head people, we know where they live, and just hold them in Israel. Do whatever you've got to do. Shut down the electricity. Do you know we supply Gaza with all its electricity? Do you know that during the war, just, just, during the war, when Hamas was shooting at us, they knocked down the power lines that brought the electricity back into Gaza. And guess what Israel did? Israel fixed the power lines. And while they're fixing the power lines, they're shooting at us. Israel sends in engineers to fix the power lines, and while they're fixing the power lines, they're shooting at us. Okay. The point is, saying I feel so bad for Gilad Shalit, whatever the price is, we got to get him back, that's having pity on the cruel people. The cruel people being the terrorists. Saying we just got to give in, because we got to get this boy back. Misplaced pity. And what did it cost? Who's now walking up to the doors of those children and families that were murdered with the planning and the help of those released in the Gilad Shalit exchange? Who's going over to say, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm one of those people who was instrumental in this release, and I feel horrible for the deaths of your children. Are they doing that now? No. It's tough. These are tough things. Anytime we talk about Israel, it's just very, very, very tough. Kindness without limits becomes an absolute cruelty. When someone decides that it's his job to be involved in every organization in town, but he's got little children at home, and they don't have their father there for homework help, they don't have their father there for dinner, they don't have their father there for anything. Because he's so busy, he's on this board and on that board, and this organization, that organization, that's not kindness. Okay. So how do you know if what you're doing is kindness or not? I talked about kindness for a long time. Last week, the last time we studied, we met. I'm talking about the greatness of doing kindness. How do I know? Maybe I'm being low. Maybe I'm on Kindness Express and the train don't stop, even if, if other people get caught under, under, underneath the wheels. My two daughters, take them. They just, the train just, just rolls right over them. How do I know? So the question is, you've got to look at yourself and say, 
how good am I at pulling myself back from kindness? If you're not sure if you're an addict, try stop whatever you're addicted to. If you're addicted to overeating, you're addicted to gambling, you're addicted to uh, whatever it is. Try and see what happens if you can stop. Alcohol, you're, addicted, you're not sure. Am I an alcoholic? Am I not an alcoholic? Well, let's see. I'll stop drinking for a month or two. Can I do that? Can I stop drinking for a month or two? If I cannot, then probably I have an addiction on my hands. So the question is, can I stop being kind? And by the way, my friends, that is the biggest and most difficult test that Abraham ever faces, which interestingly comes right after the story of Sodom. The last test. Ba'asara nisyonos nisnasa Avram. Avram Avinu went through ten different nisyonos. Ten different incredible, incredible challenges of his moral fortitude. V'amad b'kulam, says the Mishnah in Perke Avos. And he withstood all those tests. Which, by the way, lets us know that we come from some pretty strong DNA. You've got in your double helix over there, a lot of ACGT, ACGT, then there's like Abraham. <laughs> and that's what gives you the ability to do almost anything, to withstand almost any test. Because you've got the Abraham gene inside of you. It's an incredible gift that's been handled down to you in your genetic code for thousands of years. And what is Avram's final test? The final test is always the hardest one. His final test is Akedas Yitzchak. When Avram comes to, when Hashem comes to Avram and says, now I want you to kill your son. Your whole life, you've been based on kindness. You are the pillar of kindness in the world. Titain emes liyakov chesed Abraham. The verse says, you give truth to Jacob and kindness to Abraham. Kindness is Abraham's trait. That is who he is. He's so much the pillar of kindness that even when he's in great pain, he's running after guests. We talked about this last time. He's the absolute paragon and pillar of kindness. But before God can decide whether Abraham is legit, he needs to see, do you know how to turn that off? Now I'm going to ask you to do something horribly cruel. I'm going to ask you to slaughter your son, the one that you love, the one that you pined away for, for a hundred years. Do you only know how to give kindness but don't know how to stop? I remember talking to a parent who was having a lot of incredible challenges with her children. Children that were saying things to her that, I mean, you wouldn't believe. You wouldn't believe. And she says to me, I don't know why my kids hate me. I give them everything. I don't know why my kids hate me. I give them everything. She was on the kindness train. And she didn't, probably didn't know. She didn't realize it. She was addicted to giving. And she gave her kids everything. Which when you give your kids everything, the one thing you don't give them is self-control. And that's why they could say things like, I hate you, you horrible you know, thing. Because they have no self-control. You haven't taught them that sometimes yes, sometimes no. There's boundaries, there's rules. It was just all give, 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 give. Okay, okay, don't worry about it, it's okay. Oh, you did a terrible, okay, don't worry about it, just don't do it again. Okay, fine, no problem. Oh, you want candy? No problem. Here's money, you want, you want this, you want, no problem, here you go. So if you want to know, was Avram doing kindness because it was the right thing, or was Avram doing kindness because that's what he loved to do? <clears throat> How do you know? You ask him to do the most unkind thing in the world possible. If the greatest kindness you could do in the world is bring a human being into the world, right? what's the greatest kindness that you can do? Bring a child into the world. Give somebody life itself. Life is the greatest gift. Who gifts somebody life? Their parents. So when we bring a child into the world, it's the greatest kindness. And taking a child out of the world would be the greatest cruelty. So God says, I need to see. Avram, this whole time you've been doing kindness, kindness, kindness. Do you know how to stop? If I were to command you to do something terrible, are you doing this because it's right? Or are you doing this because it makes you feel good? 
I'm going to tell you that the right thing for you to do right now is to do something horribly cruel. Can you do it? And Avram is able to do it. And we'll talk more about that probably next week, God willing. We also have another thing I want to go back to Lot about. There's just too much here to cover in one week. But it's only after Avram passes the test of the Akedah, where he's got Isaac bound up, and he's got the knife over Isaac, and you can imagine this is the most horrific and horrible thing. Avram, in a, in a flash of a heartbeat, if God said, kill yourself, Abraham, that would have been so easy. So easy in comparison. All right, God, you want me to kill myself? Glug, glug, glug. You want me to kill my child? I can't, I can't. God says, clear your child. And Abraham says, if that's what you want, if that's what the divine will is, if that was what the right thing in the world is right now, I don't understand it, but if you're saying that it's the right thing right now, I will do it. And then Hashem says, Now I know that you fear God. Now that I see you have an on switch and you have an off switch, now I know that you really are a master of kindness because you've proven that you can go against kindness. Interesting, later we're going to see Yaakov is called the man of, of MS, the man of truth, which is interesting because of all the forefathers, Yaakov almost seems to be the most sneaky. Get his, stealing the, brother, the blessings from his brother, making the, the, the little sticks in the troughs to make the animals. It seems like if any of the forefathers is like a little bit tricky, you know, a little bit left of kosher, you know, it would seem to be Yaakov. But no, the idea is, in order to be a master of something, you have to know when to use it and when to turn it off. And if you can only, if, if you're only have it stuck in the on position, then you're not a master of anything. You're just an addict. Lo was a kindness addict. He didn't deserve to get rewarded for that at all. He was an addict. Look what he did. Take my daughters. That's, I mean, literally, that's an addict speaking. Speak to people who work with real, like, heroin addicts. I mean... That is literally what they'll say. Take my daughters, like take my kids, take whatever you want. Just give me the give me the dope. I mean, talk to people who work with real, real addicts. Addicts will sell their parents, will sell their kids, and their 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 they're just their brains are not functioning. All that's functioning is this insane addiction that's overtaken them, and there's no rationality. Take my kids, just give me the dope. That's what Lot is. Lot is a kindness addict. By the way, for that he gets no credit. What does he get credit for? What does Lot love? Lot loves money. When he gets a choice to separate from Abraham, where does he go? Where the money's at, right? Sodom and Gomorrah. Big, wealthy areas. He loves money. And believe it or not, for Lot, it was difficult. For most of us, it wouldn't be difficult. Don't, I can either rat out my uncle and he'll die, and then I'll get a big prize, or I could say nothing, and I get no cash money. Hmm, okay, for us, it's like, I, we can make a decision 10 times a day, all day with no problems. For Lot, that was a battle. And by the way, that's why he deserves to get tested. He deserves to get rewarded for it. We get rewarded based on what's difficult for us. Lot doing kindness was not even a good thing. Forget that. So we said, why did he get rewarded for not ratting out his uncle? He would have been the biggest scoundrel in the world. That's true. But for Lot, it was still difficult. And for that, he got rewarded. Right? Which talks of another thing. Man, there's so much. There's so much. <clears throat> Everybody has their circle, their locus of free will. So the greatest rabbi in the world, his locus of free will is like, you know, do I learn 18 hours a day or do I slack off and only learn 17, right? <coughs> Kick back and lay back, take it easy, only learn 17. That's not my free will at all. That's not where I'm at. So that's not my choices. And I'm not going to get punished for not studying 17 hours a day. You have somebody who lives in the barrio, or in the ghetto, or in the deep rural south poor, and he's part of a gang, and they're robbing this woman's house, and she starts getting up after them to, like, to, uh, to try to stop them. And everybody else in the gang, in a heartbeat, would just smash her in the head with the butt of a rifle. And this guy just says, Grandma, sit down. All right, just sit down. I don't want to hurt you. And he walks out. He might get rewarded for that, as strange as it seems. Right? Because for him, that's difficult. For Lo, it's actually difficult. 
to not rat out his uncle, which to us would seem unthinkable. But guess what? It would also seem unthinkable for us to go rob an old grandmother in her trailer. But for this guy, it is not only thinkable, it's been his life his whole life. So the fact that he holds back from smashing her in the head, that's like, wow, that took self-control. You get credit for that. So Lo, and the, the reason why that's important is sometimes we look at something that we're struggling with and we're like, Ugh. it's like, whatever. Any, any normal person wouldn't do this. So why am I even struggling with this? And the answer is because that's actually where your locus is. And that's amazing because that means if you're successful at this, you are a rock star hero. I met with somebody last week, this, this week, Monday, and we're schmoozing. And he told me, I said, you know, how's it going? How's your Jewish journey going? He said, I'll tell you, ever since I've joined Partners, a couple months ago I made a decision, I'm not eating seafood anymore. No shrimp, lobster, oysters. He said, I didn't even tell anybody that I don't want to get any fights with anybody. I don't want people to start saying, oh, you're getting all crazy. Right? You're not eating oyster. You must be crazy. You're not eating rocks with weird looking, gooey, goopy, nasty smelling, weird tasting stuff inside. You must be crazy. So he says, you know, he says, the other day I was out with my wife and she said, hey, should we get a dozen oysters? And I said, oh, you know, you can, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really. And he's like, well, yeah, but he's like, I know, it's nothing. I mean, whatever. I'm like, I'm still not keeping kosher. I said, no, don't give me this, it's nothing. So you're a hero. You're a hero. That was clearly something difficult for you. You possibly, with that decision, have grown more than I've grown in the last year. Like, literally, I'm serious. You and I have different locuses of free will, but you made a major move forward. That was very difficult for you. So if you, my dear audience, if you're struggling with something, and you're like, it's not even a struggle. No one else is even dealing with this. This is my craziness. A credit? I'm not getting credit for none of this. I get credit if like, I actually become a righteous person. This is like, I'm dealing with this insanity right now. But no, Lo was rewarded with his life being saved because he didn't rat out his uncle Avram. Why? Because it was difficult for him. Would it be difficult for you? No, it doesn't make a difference. It's difficult for him. You get rewarded. Ben hey hey Omer. Ben hey hey says, tells us the mission of Pirkei Avos, Lefum Tzara Agra. You get rewarded based on what's difficult for you. So whether you decide to eat a little differently, a little more kosher, you decide that on Shabbos, I'm not going to read secular books. A lot of people admit, that, of course, Shabbos. Some people are like, are you crazy? Shabbos, you don't read secular books. What do you do all day? You know? Everyone's in different places. But if you made the decision, it's difficult for you, and you're a hero. You're a hero. Lo, believe it or not, was a hero for not ratting out his uncle because it was difficult for him because he loved money. And the whole way down, when they're driving for the last five hours of that journey down to Egypt's border, after he heard Avram talking about it, he was back and forth. Yes or no? Yes or no? And then he made the supreme decision. No, I'm not doing it. His life gets saved for that. Okay. So as a summary, my friends, we learned two things. Number one, don't be so kind. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> be absolutely kind. But make sure you know, that, I'll give you another example, by the way. You see this all the time. A guy will walk into a hospital room, and somebody's recuperating there, right? They're just post-surgery. Oh, hey, Johnny, I came to visit you. And they're like, okay, yeah. Listen, man, uh, how are you feeling? And the, guy's like, like, the guy could barely talk, and he wants to just sleep. He just got out of surgery. But you came to do a mitzvah, right? We're on Kindness Express. Boom. The Kindness Express don't stop. Johnny, man, he starts shaking him. He's like, ah, oh, like, you're shaking out his lines, and the like, nurses come running. <laughs> you just want to do a kindness. You go to a, a, a shiva home sometime, and this person walks in who barely, there's a the family sitting around. It's one of the early days of shiva, and it's mostly family, because the other people are sensitive enough to say, let's let the family sit for a little while before we start showing up and mobbing them. They need a little time. The family came in from all over. I'm going to let them sit for a while, come the third day, the fourth day, whatever it is. But no, this, the Kindness Express pulls right up to that Shiva home, parks himself right in that front seat, right in the middle, and starts telling them, oh, your father, he was such a great man, I'm telling you, don't worry about it, he's in a great place right now. <laughs> They'll be like, he's in a great place, he's six feet under the ground. They're like, hey, go to his room, he's not there. But don't worry about it, like, the Kindness Express has showed up, all is taken care of, Kindness Express is here to save the day. And then the, the mourners, tuk, 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 they get stuck under the wheels of Kindness Express, and the poor, the sick person gets stuck under the wheels of Kindness Express. 
we've got to realize that everything in this world is not good or bad. It's all, all about how it applies. And even kindness is not good or bad. It all, it's all about how it's applied. So let's make sure we do our kindness with extreme sensitivity. And also, let's also make sure we recognize that whenever we're struggling with this, with, it doesn't make a difference if other people are struggling with it or not. That's our struggle. That's our locus. And we become heroes for being successful at that. Thank you very much and have a wonderful week.